Thank you, first of all, to uh, the organizers of this terrific conference with a bold and optimistic message, Marcus and Stefan and, and Jens especially. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here for the first time in Bonn. As I say, the conference is uh, boldly and optimistically, from my point of view, called the New Realism. But as we celebrate that here in the United States, there are many celebratory conferences celebrating the New Relativism. And you may find this as a bit of a surprise. So the intellectual climate seemed to be somewhat moving in the op opposite directions. Um, it's not quite completely clear that the clash is total because what was distinctive about the anti-realism that has dominated Europe is that the fact that it was a kind of global anti-realism. It was suspicious of the very idea of a fact, of an objective fact, um, regardless of the kind of fact. So that's why we could get a paper that's considering the objectivity of the fact that salt is sodium chloride. I mean, it went all the way down to facts like that. Whereas in the United States, uh, that isn't true. There isn't that kind of suspicious suspicion of the idea of the, very, of the very notion of an objective fact. Rather, though, there is a kind of growing interest in anti-realist and specifically relativist views of particular domains. Some people are focusing on the case of aesthetics, judgments of taste. Others are focusing on, for instance, uh, strangely enough, epistemic modals, words like might or propositions involving might. Uh, certainly many have been favoring a uh, relativistic view of morality. Um, now, I certainly think that the global kind of anti-realism that sometimes goes by the name of postmodernism and which has dominated Europe, I, I, I think that that is demonstrably unintelligible as I tried to explain in my 2006 book, uh, Fear of Knowledge. Um, but, you know, even after you have established that there is such a thing as an objective fact, and maybe even have established some examples of those, like there have been mountains, um, that leaves many, many things open. It leaves open, of course, that some facts are mind-dependent, it leaves open that some are socially constructed, which I think they are, as in the case of money and marriage and so forth. It also leaves open that some domains of discourse are systematically error-ridden, so that although we talk about them and we're not relativists about them, nevertheless, nothing in the world answers to them. Um, uh, so, for instance, the way that we think, for instance, phlogiston theory. Nobody is a relativist about phlogiston theory, but the fact is, since there is no phlogiston, um, that theory is wrong. So that, that kind of option about a domain of discourse is left open. And of course, one of the things that's left open is that various of the domains that we're interested in, for example, morality, uh, might deserve a relativistic treatment. So, um, now, you remember Susan Hawk was saying that uh, in every department that she was a member of, there was always somebody who was opposed to relativism. And I don't think we've ever been colleagues in the, in the same department, but if we had been, I would have been that person. Because I continue to remain uh, very suspicious of relativistic views about, especially about normative subject matters. And that's the topic that I want to discuss today. I think you cannot actually make sense of a relativistic view where the subject matter is, as in the case of morality, a normative subject matter involving uh, concepts like ought or has a reason to. Um, now, we should say, of course, a little bit 
about what we're going to mean by a normative subject matter. Um, and this is actually not so easy because, I think Susan was saying this as well, uh, people are all over the place when it comes to the use of this word. They use it in very many different ways. Of course, it is a technical term, so you may use it in different ways. So what really matters is for you to get clear about the notion that we're talking about. We get clear about what we want to say about that. Then if you think, oh, well, you know, I have a different notion of relativism in mind. That's terrific. You put that on the table and we discuss that. We never want to get bogged down in discussions of terminology for their own sake. So I want to start with, though I will then consider other definitions of relativism, I want to start with the one that I think is most central. It's most central in the sense that it really captures a kind of uh, anti-objectivist punch that I think the relativist is after. Uh, and moreover, is quite easy to motivate. So it has that combination of features of being something for which you can give a good rationale for taking it seriously in the first place, and it also seems to capture the kinds of intuitions that drive people to want to say about themselves that they're relativist. We can then consider different versions and weakenings of the idea once we see that it runs into difficulty. So the view I have in mind holds that for a given domain, there can be faultless disagreements within that domain. Okay. Let me illustrate this with the example with which it's typically illustrated, judgments of personal taste. And this brings us to the first entry on the handout. So suppose I say Brussels sprouts are delicious. Well, you, you find them vile, you hate them, as many people do. You might assert the opposite. You might assert they're vile, they're certainly not delicious. Now, when we look at these two judgments, it's very natural to think that you and I are in genuine disagreement. Okay, I am saying that Brussels sprouts, seem to be saying, have a certain property, and you, deliciousness, and you are denying that. Uh, I am not, it seems, in this case, merely reporting on my subjective taste for them, a report that I might equally well have made by saying, number three on the handout, I like Brussels sprouts. Okay, if I'm saying just I like Brussels sprouts, and when you express your opposed view, all you are saying is I don't like Brussels sprouts, right? then since those two things can easily be true together, I like something, you don't like it, fine, um, we don't have a genuine disagreement. You only get a genuine disagreement if it looks as though the thing that you are asserting is the negation of the thing I'm asserting. So, going by the linguistic appearances, um, we say, right, we have somehow uttered two judgments that are genuinely opposed to one another, and that puts us in genuine disagreement. Now, however, if you've, get, if you've gotten that far, you might then get nervous about the idea that despite the fact that uh, we're disagreeing, now, uh, one of us has got to be wrong. Now, that's typically what would happen if you had a, a genuine disagreement. For instance, if the disagreement were between five and six, and the earth is flat, somebody says, and another person says the earth is not flat, it's spherical. Well, if we look at that, and that counts as a genuine disagreement, we think, well, okay, both of you can't be right. Okay, one of you has got to be wrong. Um, but we're, we're nervous about saying that in the Brussels sprouts case. Well, one of you has got to be wrong. Well, really? I mean, uh, are there really facts that settle whether the Brussels sprouts are or are not delicious if... One perfectly normally functioning person says that they're vile. Or if many, many, maybe even half the population might think that. It might be genuinely divided. Now, it's important that... Uh, so, so um, what we attempted to say in the Brussels sprouts case is 
that there is a genuine disagreement here, but it's not the case that one or the other person has to be mistaken. Um, it's important to recognize that this is not merely an epistemic claim. That is, that we're not saying that a person judging Proposition 1 can be just as justified in his claim as the person judging 2. Uh, the pre-Aristotelian Greeks who believed five could have been just as justified as we are in believing Proposition 6. They had access to very different kind of evidence, uh, and relative to the evidence to which they had access, they may have been just as justified in believing that the Earth is flat as we are in believing 6, that it's not. So we can get cases of equal justification in the factual case even as we think that one or the other of these people has got to be wrong, okay? Wrong in the sense of having said something untrue. Now, the, uh, the sense in which the relativist, therefore, has to insist that both participants to the disagreement can be faultless is not a merely epistemic one. It's rather to say something like, going by the ultimate kind of correctness, of which these judgments of taste are capable, one and two can be equally correct. So that's why you have a definition of faultless disagreement. On the handout, you get a faultless disagreement between A and B when A believes P, B genuinely disagrees with A, typically by believing a content that's incompatible with P, and secondly, going by the ultimate kind of correctness of which these judgments are capable, both of these contents are correct. Now, um, we're going to obviously have to labor a little bit to explain how it is that both of these judgments could be correct, given that in the normal case, you can't have, the, you can't have it be true that both P and not P. So obviously the relativist has a certain amount of work ahead of themselves. But before I look at that, I want to make a case for thinking that um, we've motivated it somewhat in the case of judgments of personal taste, but there is even a motivation. This motivation extends to the normative, to the moral domain, which is something that... Um, you might find prima facie implausible. That is, you think, yes, you've given me an example of something that deserves to be taken seriously in the case of Brussels sprouts, but how does it extend to the moral domain? So let me just very briefly look at that. Suppose once again that we have what looks to be a moral disagreement. This would be propositions whoop, seven and eight. Seven says educating women and girls is morally required. And let's suppose you've grown up in a Taliban community and you assert, no, it's actually morally impermissible to educate women and girls. Now, of course, the first step uh, of showing that there's a genuine disagreement here, and these are not just subjective states of mind, is very easy. They do look like they're in very stark disagreement with one another. The second step is the one that seems counterintuitive and hard to stomach, for surely we don't think that such a disagreement could be faultless. Surely in this case we're simply inclined to think one person is right and the other one is wrong. Nevertheless, and this is why moral relativism is so tempting to people, many people in reflective moments will get nervous about the existence of facts that would adjudicate such a dispute. We are struck by the fact that such disagreements, when they arise, look as though they might be rationally irresoluble. That is, we certainly can't imagine settling a dispute about what is and is not morally required in the same way as we might settle a dispute about the shape of the planet by pointing to some evidence and saying, look, it is spherical. The other thing that bothers people is even if they think that they might be able to point to this or that consideration, is to think, well, where would these moral facts that settle these disputes, especially if they're, when they're fundamental? Of course, there are things that you can reduce to other things about which you agree. But when you go to some very fundamental dispute, where would these facts come from? 
they certainly don't seem built in to the impersonal fabric of the universe in the way that facts about chairs and tables and electrons are built. And many people are no longer comfortable with the idea that they might be determined by the dictates of an almighty being. So you don't have God as the source of moral facts. They don't seem to be reducible to the facts you recognize about electrons, tables, and chairs. Where would they come from? But if there are no such facts, and we can't imagine doing without moral discourse altogether and jettisoning it in the way we might have done with phlogiston theory, then faultless disagreement beckons as a compelling account of what's going on in moral discourse. And you get there, it seems to me, you know, uh, with, with, with what look to be quite plausible considerations. You don't end up somewhere that seems plausible, but you end, you end up there motivated. Now, so now we have to turn to the task of saying, well, how could faultless disagreement be possible in the, in, in the case of these judgments? And, now you, and you might have a thought like this. Look, we know of a very successful relativistic thesis, namely Einstein's theory of special, the special theory of relativity. That theory presents us with what is standardly referred to as a relativistic view of such properties as mass and time order, simultaneity in particular. Couldn't we use the framework that's provided by the special theory to help us make sense of relativism about morality? And that was, in fact, the approach that Gilbert Harmon, who was the most prominent moral relativist, took when he developed his version of moral relativism. And the answer is no. The special theory can't help you if relativism involves faultless disagreement. And to see why, we need to take very, a very brief look at the way in which Einstein's theory of, say, simultaneity is relativistic. So what does Einstein teach us? He teaches us that, especially for two events that are separated in space, there is no absolute fact of the matter as to whether or not they occurred at the same time. Okay? For any such two events, you have to, the question of what order they occurred in and whether they occurred at the same time is a function of a variable frame of reference. We don't, certainly don't need to get into the details of this, just the bare bones. You have to specify a spatial temporal frame of reference, and relative to that frame of reference, um, facts about whether the two events are or are not at the same time is determined. So if we look at this and we think, OK, so what that means is, Whereas before, pre-Einstein, we were inclined to say such things as Proposition 9, event E1 and event E2 are simultaneous. Um, now we have to, if we're being strict, say only things like 10, E1 and E2 are simultaneous relative to a variable frame of reference F, which I can specify. Um, of course, in the usual case, you won't need to make any special mention of the variable frame of reference. For instance, as we sit here in this room, and we're basically uh, all in the same spatial temporal frame of reference, uh, if I say to you, you know, I'll meet you at sunset, I don't further have to specify the frame of reference because it's understood and it's salient. Um, but if you were speaking strictly correctly, and the matter had some significance, you would have to say which frame of reference you were. Um. In the same way, by the way, as when you make judgments about what's to the left of what and what's to the right of what, I don't mean politically, I just mean spatially, you will sometimes have to specify the vantage point from which this fact obtains. Okay. Now, um, if we try to apply the template of relativism about properties that is made available by the special theory to the moral case, we would get something like the following view. We would get the view that the moral relativist holds that 
Um, there is no such thing as the act of being right or the act of an act being right or an act being wrong. Okay, just like that. There is only being right or wrong relative to a background moral code. Just like there is simultaneity relative to a frame of reference. So you would, if you were speaking strictly correctly, you would no longer say things like seven, educating women and girls is morally required to express your view, but something more like 14, educating women and girls is morally required by a particular moral code, the moral code of 21st century Westerners, let's just say, you know, these, it won't matter exactly how you specify this. Um, but now, notice that if we are restricted to making judgments of like 14, then there really is no prospect of making sense of interperspectival disagreement, because there can be no interperspectival disagreement. My Taliban imagined Taliban opponent would assert 14 star, educating women and girls is morally impermissible by the code of the Taliban, okay? And this would not conflict with 14. Just like I like Brussels sprouts and you don't like Brussels sprouts, don't conflict, they can both be true. 14 and 14 star can both be true because it can be true according to one code that one thing is required and true according to another code that that thing is forbidden. Um, so uh, we do not stand any chance of making sense of the phenomenon we started out with just by relativizing to moral codes. We actually lose the phenomenon. Now, you might have the following thought before I go on to consider other ways of making sense of the phenomenon. Uh, said, look, uh, let's go along with your claim that the special theory doesn't shed any light on this notion of faultless disagreement. But maybe what this should be taken to show is that faultless disagreement is, after all, not essential to relativism. After all, there is a sense in which Einstein's account is relativistic. Okay. So maybe that's relativism enough. Let's figure out what that sense is okay, and just stick with that as an account of relativism. Now, as I say, I, I don't want to quibble about uh, the use of the word relativism. And I'm certainly prepared to count a wide range of views as relativistic. But I think one thing that any relativistic view of a domain should retain is the subject matter of the domain. That is, it should be the case that when you say this is a relativistic view of simultaneity, when you look at what that is, the notion of simultaneity has somehow or other been preserved. We are still talking about time order, it's just that we have a relativistic view of that domain rather than having switched to talking about some, something else. Um, but, and preservation of subject matter, you see, is clearly preserved in the Einstein case. We're still talking about mass. We're still talking about time order, but we have given a relativistic as opposed to an absolutist view of those properties. However, when you use the Einstein template to the, in the moral case, we lose the subject matter of morality altogether. To see the problem, note that the statement educating women is the educating women is right is clearly a normative statement. Okay. That is, it is a prescriptive statement. It says what ought to be done. But the statement, educating women is right relative to the moral code of Westerners, is just a descriptive remark that carries no normative import whatsoever. It's just a way of characterizing what is and is not claimed by a particular moral code, that of Westerners. And we can see this from the fact that anyone, regardless of his or her views about the role of women, can agree that educating women is right according to the moral code of Westerners. Even the, if, especially, even the Taliban agree that according to the moral code of the West, educating women is correct. That's precisely what makes this so objectionable. 
That's the crucial. So everyone, regardless, as it were, of their intuitive moral commitments, can agree with statements like 14 and 14 star. These are just descriptive remarks. So if your only way of making sense of a relativism about morality is to use the Einstein template to, as it were, relativize the properties, then you've lost the subject matter and you're no longer actually talking about morality, not even a relativistic view of it. So let me call this the problem of the loss of normative content. So what I've been saying is, if all we had to work with is the model provided by the simultaneity case, it doesn't look like there is anything useful for moral relativism to be. The question is, is there a way out for this? Is there a fix? Um, Well, you might have the following thought. You see, both the problem of the disappearance of disagreement and the loss of normative content seem traceable to one thing, namely, having made the relativization explicit in the contents of the moral judgments themselves, so that these judgments become about the relation between moral properties and moral codes. And the thought then occurs to you, well, can't we think of ways in which we might respect the denial of absolutism but without having to make moral judgments explicitly about the relativization to moral codes. And one of the reasons that there is so much uh, excitement in the United States these days about the new relativism is that people think that they have an answer to this kind of issue by adopting a relativistic view of truth itself rather than adopting a relativistic view of the judgments of the domain in question. So these are known as alethic relativisms because they're relativisms about truth. Truth, not necessarily all truth, that is the truth predicate quite generally as it applies to all domains, but of the truth predicate in particular domains, in particular in the case of morality. Um, So, to just give an illustration in terms of the case that we've been talking about, the idea is that when we look at the Einstein case, namely 9 and 10, you look at 9, you don't have to say, in order to be a relativist about simultaneity, on this alethic view, You don't have to say, look, stop making assertions like 9, only make assertions like 10. You say, no, you can keep making assertions like 9, but just realize that assertions like 9 or contents like 9 only have relative truth values. They don't have absolute truth values. Uh, They only have truth value relative to a variable frame of reference, but you don't have to stick that into the content. You just leave the content as it is. And when you do that in the moral case, of course, it means that you can keep a proposition like 7 and not expand it to 14. You just say, right, you can continue saying educating women and girls is morally required. It's just that you have to recognize this has a truth value only relative to background codes. Now, so it looks as though if you do that, I mean, here there's, of course, a huge amount to be said about what it would be to treat the truth predicate in this way, and I'll try to say a little bit about that uh, later on, but, but you see why it gives you an initially promising idea about how to solve both the problem of disagreement and the problem of the loss of normative content. 
Because in keeping a proposition like seven, well, if you have seven and you, have, you can also keep asserting something like eight, well, then you have something that is the, one thing is the negation of the other thing, so it looks as though disagreement across perspectives is possible. And since you have left them in their pristine normative form, it looks as though you've retained the normativity that we wanted. So you have a simultaneous, as it were, solution to both the problem of disagreement and the problem of the loss of normative content. Or so it seems. Now, unfortunately, I think this appearance is illusory and that not only does an alethic relativism uh, not solve these problems, it incurs many other ones as well. So the upshot is that, uh, partly what many contemporary philosophers seem to think, an alethic relativism can no, can no more help us with the problems with which we started than the quasi-Einsteinian view. Now, how much time is left for me to do that? Okay, good. So, now there are many, many different issues we could look at, um, but I'll try to look just at two. So one thing that you would want to consider at this point is to ask yourself, let's think a little bit about what these background moral codes are to which we are going to say the truth values are relative. Gilbert Harmon, for instance, when he uh, describes them, says, and I'll quote, I think the quote's on the handout, members of different cultures often have very different beliefs about right and wrong. These are the background codes. Um, and they often act quite differently on their beliefs. Some societies allow slavery. Some have caste systems, which they take to be morally unsatisfactory. Others reject both slavery and caste systems as grossly unjust. So it is, as he says, it's quite natural when you think about these background codes. What is a code? Well, it looks like it's a very general moral proposition that says slavery is all right or slavery is not all right and so on. And these are, the co these are the codes to which you're relativizing the truth values of individual judgments. Um, and if you ask, well, what is it for a judgment to be true or false relative to one of these codes? You could give a very simple account in terms of entailment. You know, if, if it entails the particular judgment that you're making, then uh, it is... Uh, true relative to that code, and if it entails the negation, then it's false relative to that code, and so forth. This is a very natural first account that you might give, but it, this clearly cannot work. Um, because ask yourself, if these are general, very general moral propositions that make up the, the background moral code, what are their truth values relative to? Or in other words, since they are general moral propositions, you can assess them for their truth values. They'd better not have absolute truth values because that would give the game away. But so they have to have only relative truth values. Well, what are their truth values going to be relative to? Can't be yet another moral code on pain of an infinite and vicious regress. So the only thing that you can say, it seems, is that they're their truth is relative to themselves. Now, the trouble is that uh, um, every proposition is, as it were, true to itself, true relative to itself, because every proposition entails itself. So, and the problem here isn't that um, I therefore have to... Uh, the problem is not that this leads to too many things being true relative to themselves. The problem is that you have to give some account of what it is for an individual person to accept a particular moral code and reject another one. But if the only account that you have is that propositions are true relative to themselves, then since I accept that all propositions are true relative to themselves, I have to accept all moral codes. That just is what it is to accept a moral code. And so it's extremely important for, from a relativistic point of view that there be such a thing as saying what it is to accept one moral code as opposed to another, but you can't do that 
if the only notion of truth that you've got working for you at the level of the propositions that make up the code is truth relative to itself. Um, but the most important problem, there are many, many others, as I say, is that actually when you look at the details of an alethic relativism, it is unable to make sense of faultless disagreement after all. The problems that we looked at in the property case simply recur. And uh, to get a sense for why, let me just read you uh, this passage from Marc Richard, which is on page three of your handout. Um, now, I should explain, Marc Richard himself is a, a relativist about judgments of, sorry, he's a relativist in, about a wide class of judgments, not necessarily moral judgments. Um, but here he's trying to explain why he doesn't think that you get faultless disagreement even if you are a relativist about judgments of taste. So this is, he's agreeing that you can't make sense of it, and I just want to look at his reason for agreeing. He says, when one is willing to ascribe truth or falsity to a particular claim P, one treats P and the claim that P is true as equivalent. Within a perspective, truth is disquotational. Suppose I think that Beaufort is a better cheese than Tom, and you think the reverse. And suppose for reductio that each of our thoughts is valid, that is, mine is true from my perspective and yours is true from yours, then not only can I validly say that Beaufort is better than Tom, I can validly say that it's true that Beaufort is better than Tom. And of course, if you think Tom is better than Beaufort and not vice versa, I can also validly say that you think it's not the case that Beaufort is better than Tom. So I can say that it's true that Beaufort is better than Tom, though you think Beaufort isn't better than Tom, from which it surely follows that you are mistaken. Because after all, if you have a false belief, he says, you are mistaken about something. Now you see, and this is all done within the framework of a relativistic view of truth. The point that Richard is making is, if I say something, whatever it is, P, uh, about cheese, um, then if I say that, Beaufort is better than Tom, it will also be true relative to my perspective that it's true that Beaufort is better than Tom. I can say that second statement. I can also observe that you're saying that Beaufort is not better than Tom. And since it's false relative to my uh, st uh, framework that Beaufort is not better than Tom, I say that what you're thinking is false. Because that's what's valid within my framework. And if I think that what you've said is false, then surely, he says, I think you've made a mistake, right? So I cannot, anybody who's already committed themselves to some view about the cheese has got to think that somebody who disagrees with them is making a mistake. Now, uh, and therefore, Richard concludes, well, let's do it in two steps. He cannot regard the disagreement as faultless, okay? And of course, by parity of reasoning, the other person cannot regard the disagreement as faultless, so the disagreement is not faultless. Um, now, I've put all of this down in the terms of these numbers to call it the, the argument from perspectival immersion. In other words, once you've immersed yourself in a perspective and you've taken some view, of course, that is our natural condition. Not, nobody denies that. Even the relativist starts there. We have some view. That might be about educating women, or it might be about cheese. And uh, the point is, once you've got a view, it looks as though there is a simple argument that takes you from, I have a view, to anybody who disagrees with me is mistaken. So let me say this about to, to the relativist who would pursue this line. 
There is a dilemma here. Now, this is, I sketched that out on the next page. If, this, if you leave this argument from immersion in place, then alethic relativism is not a recognizable form of anti-objectivism and is anyway unstable. On the other hand, the only plausible way to reject it, okay, which Richard does not consider, and I will consider on behalf of the relativist, leads back to the problem of the loss of disagreement and the loss of normative content. So you're stuck. That's the idea. Um, now, I won't have time to do this in, in detail, so let me try to indicate briefly how the argument goes. Um, I mean, I think the first horn is relatively clear, which I've already explained. It really is, I mean, you don't get, you don't get anything that looks recognizably relativistic in spirit if whatever your view is about the operation of the truth predicate, you have to regard anyone who disagrees with you as mistaken. You know, the way we usually think is, look, as I say, when we started out with the Brussels sprouts, or take about table manners, I'll come to etiquette in a minute if I have time. You know, here's a, here's a, uh, here's a relativistic view of etiquette, roughly. Or, you know, should you put your elbows on the table while you eat? Well, I don't, but if you do, that's fine. That sounds relativistic. Uh, but if you take the following view, I do, and I regard anyone else who does the opposite to be making a mistake, that sounds like you're being an objectivist about table manners. <laughs> okay. So having this idea that you're not making a mistake is really an important part, essential part, it seems, of relativism. But so far we have it on very, very purely logical grounds that even if you've embedded your view within a relativistic view of truth, you still have to regard anybody else as making a mistake. And the, so that's the bit about how it doesn't look like a form of anti-objectivism. The, um, there's a further claim in here that it actually leads to the view's instability. And that is that, you see, the relativist says, this thing only has relative truth values. And there is a sense in which none of these truth values that it can acquire relative to different kinds of code and evaluation are privileged with respect to one another. But if I take the view that anybody who is disagreeing with me on something is making a mistake, I'm going to be privileging my framework. I'm going to say, no, that I don't, want to, I don't care about the truth values it gets relative to that framework. That's getting it wrong. Okay. So therefore, um, I am privileging my framework. And uh, if you're doing that, why not say that these judgments do have absolute truth values after all, because the absolute truth values are the relative truth values that they get relative to the best perspective, namely mine. Was this a point that was previously made? No, that's just the correct point. Oh, good. Absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> Uh, now, if we, were, we, if we had time, I, there's a thing here called the, the, the non-committal theorist's perspective, which is you might think, well, maybe the participants themselves have to regard it like this, but couldn't there be some, as it were, godlike theorist who's, who's looking at this from a distance and saying, uh, no, no, I see it's really faultless disagreement, although these jokers here have got to take a much more committed view. But I won't discuss that. Now, um, we come to the second horn, so we think, okay, right, we cannot accept this argument from immersion, we have to find some way of rejecting it, and the, you ask yourself, well, which of these propositions that I've laid down from 20 through 25, which one of them would you reject? I won't have the time to go into this in great detail, but um, let me assure you that, that 
for the most part, they're either trivial logical or obvious logical principles and or definitional. The only play that you have is with proposition number 23. Now, 23 says, if it's valid for D to judge that it's false that not P, then it's valid for D to judge that anyone who judges that not P is making a mistake. And that's the one that's the one you've got to look at because what that premise is doing, all the rest of them are just saying you start, you start with P, then if you say P, you can say it's true that P, and if you say it's true that P, then you can say it's false that not P, and if you say it's false that not P, then what? And the idea is 23 says, yeah, if you say that it's false that not P, you have to regard that as a mistake. Now the question is, is there any play here so that we can say, I'm saying P, I'm saying it's true that P, I know that you're saying not P, uh, and I know that therefore it's false that not P, but can I take a more tolerant view of the fact that what you said is false? And there is some play that you can, that you can have with this. Um, you see, it depends on distinguishing... So, what, what kinds of norms govern a relativistic truth predicate? So in other words, when we're absolutists about truth, we think, well, the aim of belief is truth. Okay? And a belief goes wrong when it's false. Ultimately, it can be justified, but it's still wrong. Incorrect. Um, what should your view of the aim of belief be? if you have a relativistic view of the truth predicate that operates on those contents. Now here you see um, you have two different options. This is on page four. You have, because you can either write these norms as depending on what the assessor thinks, or write them as depending on what the thinker thinks, or rather, what the thinker's code says. So the assessor relative belief says that a thinker's belief P is correct if and only if P is true as judged from within the assessor's perspective. Whereas the thinker relative norm says a thinker's belief that P is correct if and only if P is true as judged from within the thinker's perspective. And what, if you look at the argument from immersion, what it's doing is giving the assessor version. So it's saying, well, as long as the assessor thinks that the proposition is false relative to their system, then that judgment is incorrect. But let's try to give it a thinker relative norm. Thinker relative norm would say, look, uh, yes, I understand that uh, I say P, it's true that P, you said not P, it's false that not P, but it's false that not P is tr true relative to my system, and as long as I recognize that not P is true relative to your system, then I can judge that what you said is correct. That's the best one can do. It's not very good. Um, there are many, many different ways. Here I'm really beginning to strain the time limits. But uh, um, I'll, so th this is a th this this is a very delicate thing that can be should be done very very carefully. But um, There are, several different, there are several different ways of bringing out why even what I said, you could hear it sounded incoherent as I was saying it. Okay. Uh, let me give you the simplest version of all. First of all, what happens when you do this is you are no longer assessing contents, but you're assessing token judgments. Okay. Because... You know, typically what we think is a belief is true if its content is true. You, you, the primary assessor of, of the primary assess, bearer of truth value is the content itself, and a belief is true provided that its content is true. Here you have to switch to thinking that the primary 
bearers of normative assessment are the token judgments because I can't say, if I have Dora who's judging P, okay, uh, somebody looking at that says, oh, well, Dora's judgment that P is true relative to her framework, so, so that's correct. And then I see Norma, and she's judging not P, and let's suppose not P is false relative to Norma's framework. So she, her judgment is incorrect. Now I've said P is correct and in, not P. P and not P are both incorrect, okay? Um, but that, the contradiction in me. So there are, the way you resolve this is you say, no, we're only assessing not the contents, but the token judgment, namely Dora's judgment that P is correct because it's true relative to her code, and Norma's judgment that not P is correct because that's true relative to her code. But that's sort of like, if I say it's morning in the morning, and you say it's afternoon in the afternoon, okay, well, obviously, both judgments are correct, uh, but there is no disagreement between them. So once you, are, once you rel start focusing on the token judgments and say the token judgments have to be judged relative to the context in which they were uttered, the disagreement completely disappears, just like it does in the case of indexical sentences, which are the classic instance of the way, uh, of, of the kinds of sentence where it's the token judgments that are assessed and not the contents. So, um, well, anyway, there's a lot more to be said. Uh, if I had the time, I would conclude with a small discussion of etiquette where I, I, I could... I, I want to talk about that because somebody might think, well, look, you've kind of boxed us out of all options here, but aren't there some vaguely normative domains, like, for instance, etiquette, about which relativism is intuitively correct? So how are you going to deal with that? But I will leave that for somebody to bring up in the discussion. Thank you. Yeah.